I think there's clearly a level of nuance that both Sagan and um, Mayer. Mayer? Mm -hmm. Mayer. Um, Ernst Mayer. Mayer. He's by was, German, by the way. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I, think, I think they kind of lacked a bit of a nuance. It seems to me that, admittedly, I didn't, I didn't have a look at the actual um, debates, but from the excerpts that you've taken, mm -hmm. they're very much treating, I think in the same way that like Simon Conway Marsh was treating humans as a very specific intelligence niche. And they were treating intelligence in the way that I think that you're not a particularly big fan of, which is just basically saying humans, we want people to be able to think like us and not acknowledging that our intelligence is a species specific trait. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me that they were, they were very much discussing this one particular niche as a sort of platonic ideal mm -hmm. of humanness mm -hmm. and not just the idea that um, perhaps it doesn't depend on sort of an overarching objective amount of intelligence, but that intelligence can factor in, in terms of just the relevant, the, the relative level of intelligence between one, say like one primate and another, another branch of the primate tree and, and the relative competition there. I'm not sure, I'm, no, I'm not sure what you said, but let me ask you a question. <laughs> Who's smarter, cats or dogs? Well, from who's smarter, I, elephants or ants? Yeah, okay. Who's smarter, uh, you know, <laughs> anyway, a, a tree or a bush? But, but I think that's, a, that's the nature of imposing mm -hmm. this one-dimensionalization of what we think is our best feature onto the rest of the world. But, and okay. it's, for me, it's, it's crackers. Uh, well, let's, Push let's back. go to a, <laughs> maybe a perhaps more specific example. Go. go. Um, our... Early ancestors, the early Homo sapiens. How early? One million, two million, three million, oh, ten thousand. Well, like when Homo sapiens branched off. That was what. Who branched off from what? From chimps? No, not chimps. Um, from what? Like Australopithecines, Homo erectus. Homo, I want to say Homo. Hom How many okay. years ago? These are all important. These are important details, by the way, because otherwise you say, "Oh, we're different. We're yeah, different." Yeah, all right, yeah. So I'm glad okay, you recognize. Homer... <laughs> um, you're turning a okay, little red. So... I'm happy that you're turning red because that detail is very important. So okay, Homo sapiens outcompeted or outcompeted or... nobody. What do you mean? We survived. I'm not sure we. Okay, outcom... we survived while Neanderthals, Denisovians, they didn't. They right? did. You have two percent of their genes. Okay. We mixed with them, and then that's what's left. But. It's, it, it seems like Homo sapiens were sort of the dominant factor in the genealogy. You're saying that I have 2% Neanderthal. What's the other 98%? Okay, okay. well, the, the, the people who mix with the Neanderthal. Now, wait a minute. Mm. So let's suppose that you had 10%. Let's mm. suppose 20%. So the same thing with the, with the Maori. So if, you're, if you go down to Tasmania, and not Maori, not Maori in New Zealand, but if you go to Tasmania, there's this, hey, there are no more Tasmanians, right? But then you have people with 50%, 80%, 10% of uh, Tasmanian Aboriginal genes. Have the, they disappeared? Many people would say, yes. And then you would say, then you would use your language and say, yes, we dominated and killed them all and they're gone. No, not at all. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you have two, it could have been 5%, would that undermine your argument here? Do not, they have not disappeared. They things mix. And so that's what we are, a mixture. Okay. Let, how about I just rephrase? Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. It seems like, we'll just narrow this down to primates. Okay. It seems like what, if we're trying to reach a compromise between these people who think that, have this platonic ideal of human intelligence. Do and, you think I'm trying to reach a compromise? <laughs> Do you I'm really think to, that's my goal? I'm to trying to get my point across, Charlie. I'm trying. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, <laughs> trying to reach a compromise here. It seems to me like what we, what we might consider intelligence is sort of humanity's adaptability slash generalist capabilities. That's right? what people say. Yeah. I disagree completely with that, okay. but that's what people okay. say. But, okay, would you say that our closest ancestors, our closest cousins, you know, chimps. The current extant chimp, extant, extant cousins, cousins yes. sure. Would you be willing to make some sort of intellectual comparison there? Well, no, because what happens, we are killing them. And your grandchildren will then not have chimps, not have gorillas, not have orangutans, and then they'll say, okay, would you be willing to compare humans and gibbons? Mm -hmm. And then their grandchildren will say, you know what, we killed all them. Would you be willing to compare humans and, I don't know, dogs? 
And then if we kill all the other dogs, maybe we won't do that. And then we can, then their grandchildren will say humans and dogs. And so, so what you, what a, we have been doing was killing these things, taking over their land, and then congratulating ourselves on how smarter we are than our nearest closest relative because we've, we've somehow our nearest relatives have okay. either mixed with us or they're gone. But in order to kill them and take their land, mm -hmm. doesn't that imply a level of intelligence? So you think British, British people are more intelligent than their Aboriginals but of Australia? Is that a, what you mean? No, there's a distinction when you're talking about it in an evolutionary sense. I by no means think... Like, it's not... Ever, if, if, the, if we killed off the Neanderthals, mm -hmm. it, was, it had, maybe had to do with gigantic battles, just like, or little battles between, the, between these tribes and ethnic, ethnic groups. So ethnic cleansing, essentially, mm -hmm. was, might have been responsible for getting rid of the Denisovans or the... Or the uh, Neanderthals, but as I said, they haven't been completely gotten rid of. But it, but that I feel like right now you're applying applying a very modern perception of it to what these, happened these, to, yeah, to five hundred thousand years ago. Yeah. Yes. To these, yes. To these... I, I deal, definitely think ethnic cleansing has been part of humanity for at least mm -hmm. it's part of it's part of chimps. Chimps do this mm -hmm. all the time. So yes, we do that, and yes, we have done that, and yes, that's responsible for what survives and what doesn't. But isn't that being responsible for what survives? That's outcompeting. That's ensuring that you're not you're not having to compete with another species, right? If so, like there's conflict you, currently. You know, between... the, you know the problem with this argument. Let me mm -hmm. just uh, the problem with this argument is that this is called social Darwinism, and that is I, I I'm my group is better. We outcompeted you, therefore we deserve to be here. And it, uh, the re one biggest argument against that is it's self-serving. And second, a lot of who survives is just chance, whether this group was ready for this particular new arrow that somebody else figured out how to use and it could shoot 10 meters further. And so these guys got lost their five best leaders and then boom, that, that tribe disappears because that, that, that's a lot of chance to that. I don't, mm -hmm. I, I don't like to put this group is better and therefore it survived. I mean, when you have cockroaches surviving in urban environments, you could say, well, are they better? Well, you know, they... they they like to scavenge in a way that our, our crap is good for them. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't call that, you know, you could call that out competing, but it's not, it shouldn't be, a tr better should not be associated with it, is what I'm trying to get across. It's, there's, not, there's no sense in which we should attribute to ourselves goodness mm -hmm. for having survived. Everything has survived. Everything that's alive today has survived, and so it's as good as anything else. But you want to associate dominance and, and goodness somehow or better. And that, that's what I'm pushing see, against. I'm not, I'm not saying better so much. Like intelligence, I'm not saying that it needs to strictly conform to... to so you think it's not better to be intelligent than stupid? Well, no, that's, I, I think that's something that I'm exploring. I, I know, I know. That was what yeah. they were exploring. Yeah. That's what Maren Smear was saying about mm -hmm. Sagan, right? That's I, like my gut reaction is that that seems like a fairly sound assumption to make. You know? I think, yeah, and that's where I, I disagree completely. Okay. But like one, if you think, if we stop thinking about it as between different species and instead think of members within the one species, mm -hmm. should, like, is there not a trend toward that values, especially, you know, if you're, if you're with thinking of primates, a more intelligent primate, which we would consider more generous, more adaptable, mm -hmm. or even in many cases more violent, because that was, that was necessary. Mm -hmm in order to be the one that passes on your genes. Mm -hmm. Isn't that more, isn't that a, a selection pressure? Isn't that something that... Well, well you, you're, you're alternating between intelligence as a one-dimensional feature where you can say one per thing is more intelligent than another, mm -hmm. and then invoking the n-dimensionality of intelligence or any feature, which I'm mm -hmm. much more comfortable with. Mm -hmm. If you want to say, hey, this species, uh, uh, survived because it was stronger. This species could, could run faster. This species had, this particular home human group had emotional intelligence. This particular was very complex. So there's all kinds of dimensionality mm -hmm. to what determines whether your group or your, your individual will survive or not. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to say that, then I'm on your side. Mm -hmm. And uh, But if you're going to say, oh, humans are in a one-dimensional sense in what we define as intelligent, human-like intelligence, better, and therefore we survive, that's what I'm pushing back on. Okay, but so if if humans suddenly disappeared, mm -hmm. there would be they might a, they might yeah, yeah. 
Uh, but okay, I mean, because they're humans... so stupid, because they invented a way to self-destruct. Sure. People say they're smart; they invented that. People, other people say, no, they're stupid for it. So that's the kind mean, of the ambiguity. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, if it, it would have to be more of a thought experiment, because in this the, in this experiment, humans disappear, but all primates are still intact as we oh, know them okay. today. Right? right experiment. Would there not be different selection pressures then? Now that there isn't the potential to come into conflict with humans. Okay, let me stop you there. I treated that in the video and I talked about how humans, this is like, um, this is, humans have spread around the globe only in the last 60,000 mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. And so in the biogeography that I went through, there were many continents that were without humans, without primates, and they did not evolve in any discernible way towards human-like intelligence. That I take as evidence that human-like intelligence, species are not trying, there's no, see, Sagan thinks there's an intelligence niche towards which things will evolve. Mm -hmm. This is what I call the fallacy of the planet of the apes, because it's so easy to assume, you know, humans marginalize themselves or fall out or become extinct, then the things will evolve towards this wonderful niche called the human-like intelligence niche, which is misnamed the intelligence niche. Why? Because we have generalized what we think is our best feature and said, it's great for everybody. But and that's wrong. I feel like, you're using this to not actually engage with the question. Right. Because what, what is there, the question? There would be different selection pressures on our closest relatives. Well, there were. There were for all these... In Australia, in New Zealand, in Madagascar, in India, in North and South America. There weren't humans there for, mo all, for this much time, and then there were for this much time. And during this time, they did not evolve in this direction. There weren't the pressure of humans saying, okay, you, I'm in the intelligence niche, so you will not evolve into it. That's the point of this biogeography. I know, like, I think, I understand that, but if I just want to focus more on our particular branch of the tree, like old world monkeys, okay, or like great apes, okay. there would be different selection pressures if humans weren't here, because there's always the potential, because our cl like our closest relatives are the ones that potentially come into the most direct conflict with us, right? Mm -hmm. We don't really care what ants are doing, but mm -hmm. if uh, chimps, mm -hmm. so, so, an so chimp ancestors were coming up against human ancestors, mm -hmm. we we behave largely in the same like ecological niche, and so there's competition that would occur there. Is that not True? Well, one, one, let me back you up with, with an argument. Uh, people say that the only reason why the only continent in the world where you have very large mammals is in Africa is because those mammals co-evolve with human hunters. Mm -hmm. And every other place, you get the human hunter coming in to Australia or to North and South America, wipe them out because those animals could not compete quickly enough with these spear-throwing, I don't know, bow and arrow shooting uh, predators that had evolved in Africa. Mm -hmm. And so that's a good argument, I think, in favor of you, that the selection pressure on the animals in Africa allowed them to get to be selected to be defend, to defend themselves against mm -hmm. these human predators. Mm -hmm. And other continents, not so much. So that, I think, would be in favor of the argument you're saying, that the selection pressure does change. Uh, but what was the other part of it? Like, this is a very specific question, but right now you've, you've got these chimps that, well, they're already coming into conflict with humans, mm -hmm. but if they were, if you were to get a particularly adaptable family, or a very particularly adaptable social group of chimps, mm -hmm. and they're trying to expand out of what we consider their habitat, mm -hmm. then they're going to come across, they're going to come into contact with humans. Mm -hmm. And obviously, in, in that case, mm -hmm. well, hit... It's, it's quite obvious what would happen, that the humans would dominate. No, no, not at all. For example, there are vast regions. Man, go back, there have been humans for, let's, I don't know, two, two, let's say 200,000 years. Mm -hmm. Let's go back 150,000 years, okay? There were chimps and humans had diverged about much earlier, six, seven million years ago. So there, there, let's look at Africa. Mm -hmm. and, and let's ask the question, let's ask the question for two million years ago, or a million years ago, which species dominated Africa. Mm -hmm. And it's not obvious that you would say humans did. In other words, there was competition, you could say, between the chimps and the humans, and it was not obvious. Humans didn't have agriculture. Humans weren't in cities. They weren't have armies. Mm -hmm. And then you put a human and a chimp in a, in a jungle, the chimp will just out-compete like yeah. crazy, that mm -hmm. human. So, so I don't, I'm not sure I'm following you what your argument is about dominance somehow. You think that 
you're saying that humans are outcompeted chimps and that's what makes us better? What, what are you saying? I'm not saying that's what makes us better. I'm saying that the way that so the way that the, the dice have fallen means that... The dice are falling, you mean in the last thousand years or 10,000 years or let's, million let's, years? Let's say the entire 250,000 years that we might have had Homo oh, sapiens, right? The dice are falling. What dice are you talking about? As in, like, it, it could very well be random chance which that humans even developed agriculture or developed yeah, civilization like it, it that came be. to dominate the world in the way that we dominate the world now. And I know you dislike that term. I disagree with it. It's not that I dislike it, I disagree with it, but go ahead. But there's four for compared to the other great apes we're doing a really good job at killing other killing out other species is that a good right? thing i'm not saying that's a good thing I'm i think saying, it's a terrible thing yeah i'm saying that that i think that's, that's really that's stupid my, that's that my makes us the stupidest that's great my ape. justification for using the word of like dominance all right i, I use the word you know, stupid okay okay so humans are the stupidest great ape yeah you accept sure. that sure <laughs> okay now you you okay go ahead go ahead um You've distracted me from my point. <laughs> well, you have time. Um, Do you have time? Go ahead. We so so it, perhaps let's just say hypothetically that the the situation was reversed. I'm not saying that like it's a plan of the what situation? scenario, what situation? but in terms of like that humans never really adapted and spread across the world in in the way we do, but maybe I oh know that's not actually bad. That's not a good one because chimps just aren't really able to do that. Well, they've, they've spread all over Africa. Mm. I'm just trying to say that the, I think it's, it's very clear that our presence affects the evolution of specifically the, our closest neighbors, just like but in generally just... presence of cockroaches also affects the presence of other insects. Mm -hmm. But cockroaches are more, are more distant from us. I'm, basically, I'm getting around to the planet of the apes scenario fallacy mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in that I do think that if humans suddenly disappeared mm -hmm. you know obviously it's not going to happen overnight you'd need to give it mm -hmm. hundreds of thousands millions of years mm -hmm. but that would that effect would change change the the selection pressures on certain things and and allow our closer specific specifically our closest relatives mm -hmm. to progress you, in perhaps a more human way mm -hmm, not saying that that's, that's definitely what would happen mm -hmm. but I'm not, and I don't think there's like one surefire, this mm -hmm. is the human-like intelligence niche. Mm -hmm. But there is a niche that we feel that because they're like us, we're going to say is more intelligent, mm -hmm. that could be expanded into if we weren't here. Mm -hmm. Well, that that is what I call the, fell, the mm -hmm. plan of the apes fallacy. And I should say that um, I think most people who have thought about this are, have been influenced by Sagan and would agree with you. Mm -hmm. Uh, that doesn't mean you're right. Mm. I would. I'm arguing, as you can see, pretty vehemently yeah, against this yeah. point of view. And I've presented. I thought I presented. Well, I think the evidence that I presented was uh, the only evidence we have. Mm. The evidence for your point of view, I think, is vanity, and okay. the evidence from my point of view is evolutionary history. Mm -hmm. And I think evolutionary history should be counted more than human vanity. But it, it's it's. I, I wasn't entirely convinced by your whole, oh, we've run six separate experiments and mm. in, in them mm -hmm. human-like intelligence well, only well, developed. Yeah, why not? Why not? Because I think um, partly, again, I know this, this is something that's not provable, but, you know, we, we, ha we would be the first if this was, the, was, if this was true. But I understand that that's not, like a, that's not a good way to argue. It's not. It's a circular argument. Yeah, yeah. But... <laughs> So yes, like it's the, a bad argument. So go ahead. What's your next one? But the 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 speed at which we evolve and spread across the world mm -hmm. is kind of like in ge in geological timescales, it was a blink of an eye, and in evolutionary timescales, it's not that massive, right? Well, the, it depends on who you say we. Are you including we Homo erectus, for example? Some people would say, oh, it's a different species. I think I suspect because our divergence time is only about two million years from Homo erectus mm -hmm. that we could we have mixed with them and we have homo erectus genes in us mm -hmm. but that hasn't been shown because we don't have any intact uh, sequences from homo erectus i think when we do which will be very soon mm -hmm. we will then go and have the same thing that went through with neanderthals oh by the way 10 percent of your genes are homo erectus genes because what, what but what does that mean that means they diverge 
our, our lineage and Homericus diverged, and then there was intermarriage, and then oh, there was intermarriage. And when that intermarriage came, then you could have A, identifiably Homo erectus genes, and B, insertion into humans who are still alive today. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what was the point? <laughs> um, <clears throat> I think, yes, if you're looking at, at, cre at life forms that are further separated from us on the phylogenetic tree fly, Obviously, there's... How far? How far? Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Let's say far enough, that, you know, far enough like the New World monkeys. Okay, right? so maybe 25 million years? Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. The, like, obviously, they're going, they're, they're not existing in the same selection pressures as the pressures that, that developed human, in, that led to humans. And well, they were on new. They were in the New World, mm -hmm. in South America. Well, the twenty-five million years. Well, I, actually, I think I got that date wrong. I think it's probably more like forty, maybe even fifty million years. So okay. I'm not quite sure of that date. But they were there in South America for probably fifty million years. Mm -hmm. And the question is, did they evolve into this supposed niche? And I would say, obviously not. But obviously, like. That, that niche might probably doesn't exist in South America where it does in Africa. Okay, so you're saying that the environmental variation in Africa is uniquely different from the environmental variation of the millions of different environments and little sub-ecosystems. Mm -hmm. So you want to say that there's exclusive ones here that were responsible for human uniqueness. I mean, in like... Uh, that's inevitably true, right? Well, we, we're affected by yeah, I know, but the, the question, environment that... Yeah, but the question we're interested in asking is, are there environments that led to the thing, whatever it was that led to us, mm -hmm. how unique were they? And we're saying, well, they weren't in South America because that, but I guarantee you South America is much, much, much closer to the environments in Africa that led to us than anything you will find anywhere in the universe. Mm -hmm. That's, I'm very, it's kind of like saying our closest ultimately... relatives in the universe are here on earth. Mm -hmm. And that's another version of it, but it's saying it in terms of ecology. I, 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 part of the reason that I'm not particularly, uh, I don't want to push back against the Planet of the Apes fallacy strictly in terms of how, like, we should be expecting human life intelligence, mm -hmm. because I am kind of more convinced of your view there, in which the way that we view this intelligence is very species specific. But, like, the simple um, thought experiment that all humans disappear without effect, without affecting drastically the ecosystem. Oh, I'd never say that. I'm just saying that they will not evolve into human... Chimpanzees will not try to evolve into human beings. I'm not saying I'm not, it won't not, change I'm things. Not, Whenever a species goes extinct, something changes. Mm. But what I'm... I, of course, of course I agree with that. What, I'm not, what I am saying is though, that once humans go extinct, extinct that and there will be other species which will, oh, the intelligence niche is empty, I'm going to go there. There will be selection pressure to go there. That is what I'm denying. But... Let's not call it the intelligence niche, but like yeah. it could just be the, the physical niche that was filled by humans compared to chimpanzees. Well, right? let's talk about the sulfur-crested cockatoos, okay? okay? Let's say they go extinct. Do you think anything will evolve into the sulfur-crested cockatoo niche? But there is a difference between the, um, how prolific... That's you. How so you're imagining the human-like niche is a better, more general one that's made humans propagate everywhere. So, for example, let's talk about cockroaches. So, let's, mm -hmm. imagine, so let's suppose cockroaches have just, boom, blossomed like this. Take away, let's say, cockroaches, uh, I don't know, they, they're kind of like uh, carrier pigeons, or what, the ones that are just popul population, then boom, they tumble and then they go extinct. Let's mm -hmm. suppose that that happens to cockroaches. Now, is there a cockroach niche into which other insects would evolve? Well, you know, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, the people who talk about convergence are sure about that. For example, they say, okay, Australia had some grass, and then there had to be something that grazed on the grass, and then so kangaroos are Australian uh, deer. Mm -hmm. de okay, so you, need, you have to have grass grazers. Now, that's a, a, it is a common thing to be, that's talked about in the ecological uh, fields, um, but I'm not quite sure. I don't think that human-like intelligence is a a niche that is as generalizable as the grass grazers. But let me go back and say, wait a minute, grass is, <laughs> grass, 
started out at, just like anything, started out as one species. So grass, the availability of grass, is a species-specific characteristic. Mm -hmm. Just because it evolved all kinds and became very successful doesn't mean that it is any more general than a species-specific, i.e. incredibly unique pr production of evolution. Just like a head. Everything has a head. Mm -hmm. And then you say, well, wait a minute. Back then, 600, 700 million years ago, there was only one species with his head. Mm -hmm. And so it's a, having a head is species-specific. So having a generalizable grass-grazing niche is species-specific. That's the And when you say the word species-specific, I mean species-specific, mm -hmm. which means unique. Mm -hmm. And that means you should not pretend that it's going to be elsewhere. But that is my argument against the convergentists. Okay. Anyway, so. I'm actually quiet. That... <laughs> that has shut me up a bit. But, I, don't, I don't want to okay. shut you up. I want you to push back. <laughs> well, no, because I like I am I'm less sure of my positions. But something else that I want to push back on, and it's perhaps a bit more philosophical, mm -hmm. is that you really want to like human exceptionalism is something that you push back against quite clearly in this course, and the the concept that we. We uh, live in a very specific general niche and that our intelligence is some sort of objective intelligence and not something that's purely just adapted to our species. But you're also very confident that we're going to be able to reach across interstellar distances somewhat uh, soon, right? Uh, I'm not confident because there might be World War Three, Four, and Five. There might be an atomic war ten, two years from now. But I'm, So I'm not confident. Okay, but you... In our conversations, you've, you've indicated that it's a clear possibility. I am all, in many ways, I support Elon Musk's efforts to make us a multi-planet species. Okay. Yes, yes. That's, that's yes. But isn't that just approaching human exceptionalism from, a, from the other direction? In that if we're, if this very specific idea of, you know, we're going to be the only, that radio telescopes are so specific to our particular type of intelligence, that it would be that we shouldn't really be expecting it on other to evolve it independently from us. Mm -hmm. Isn't that also saying that we're exceptional in that we're the the one species that's going to oh, be able to build rockets and I, and, and I think go we're I think we're exceptional. Direction. We are unique, just like every other species. Mm -hmm. But there is a there is just a, like every other species. Mm -hmm. I'll say it again. We are unique just like every other species. That does not mean that our uniqueness should be over there and over there and over there. But that's exactly what Carl Sagan is saying. Mm -hmm. That, hey, there are multiple pathways to this type of intelligence and therefore we should expect that. I'm saying that's all wrong. You're misreading the whole evolutionary history and that's what Ernst Mayer is trying to say. Mm -hmm. I, have, I have nothing against the word exception if you change it to unique mm -hmm. because exception has a positive connotation. I'm trying to get rid of this vain, positive connotations of thinking we're the best thing that ever happened to the Earth. That, I think, is the destruction of what I love about being a human being. Okay. And so humility is important, and all I see is vanity. That's why I'm pushing back, so, and I get angry. Mm -hmm. But I, I think there's also a degree of vanity present in the idea that uh, we, we could very well be the only, only creature to ever be able to travel across the stars, you know, to... to become an interplanetary species, say. Why vanity? I would say we can, if we can do it, and we might be able to do it if we can mm -hmm. stay alive, if we're not so stupid, because the bigger our brains get, I think the stupider we're getting. Okay. I think it's a very important that our brains do not get bigger, because okay. then we'll become insane, and then we'll just kill ourselves, because you'll look in the mirror and fall in love with ourselves at a deeper level, because we have more neurons to do it. So I think it's very important that we stay stupid, and if we stay mm -hmm. stupid, I think we'll be able to do it. But if we start getting this so smart that, oh, you'll yeah, figure out this and figure out that, and then we'll figure out that we don't mean anything, and then, you know, then meaning will be lost, and then we will, I don't know. Haven't you already figured out that we don't mean anything? No, you're no. Not, you're, not no. A, you're not a man of faith? No, not at all, not at all. But I do realize that my ancestors and your ancestors have been selected to think that we are more important than, you know, that rock over there. Mm -hmm. And that is something that's true of, it's almost like the definition of life, that you are selected to think you're important and to do everything you can to stay alive. That is intrinsic to thinking you're important. Mm -hmm. and, but that is also <laughs> intrinsic to screwing up things royally. And so that balance is something that we have to keep in mind and when I hear of human exceptionalism, I don't see people with balance. I hear, hey, we're in control, therefore we're better. 
And that, that is something that I think is deadly. So I, I, I understand this idea that we are equally as intelligent as, say... That you're one-dimensionalizing something now? Who do you think you're talking to? Equally as intelligent. I'm using, I'm using intelligent as... As a one-dimensional okay, quantity. We are, we, are perf we are exactly as well suited to our niche as that tree. How about your office, that yeah. tree has survived for four billion years and we and have so too. Have we. Okay. Yeah. If you want to say that, I'm happy with it. It's more neutral phrasing of mm -hmm. whatever you're trying to say here, but go ahead. Okay. So, and, and in that sense, you, you emphasize that every spe we are unique. We are as unique as every other species. Is uh, unique. I, I didn't go that far. Was like, we are unique just like every other species. Whether you're going to quantify the, how unique something is, that's, okay. you know, that's okay. all. But again, do, that's that might be a fool's that's game. Semantic. That's semantic. <laughs> um, but it's, it, so essentially you're expecting that even this idea of traveling to other stars or, you know, colonizing Mars, that's such a human oriented it, it, it's so predicated on how we view the world. Stop, I'll stop you there. Okay. Humans are e ecosystems. You, are, you have back mitochondria mm -hmm. in there. You have mm -hmm. bacteria all over you. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as a human going by itself as a species to an anywhere in the planet, because mm -hmm. they're anywhere in the universe, because they'll die immediately, because yeah. we are dependent on these other life forms. Mm -hmm. So in some sense, we, rep we are other life forms. Yeah. So, so that's why I didn't like your language of, if we are the only species. No, we have, you know, there, there are bacterial spores on the moon, and when we go to Mars, it will be completely, well, not completely, but there will be bacterial selection for, because we can't go anywhere without our bacteria. Mm -hmm. You know, NASA says, oh, sterilizing things. They can't sterilize anything because it's just an intrinsic part of who you are. If you sterilize somebody, the person dies. If you ever yeah. drink isotonic water, you can't, it tastes terrible and you can't get any nutrients from, you have to be, it has to be a mixture. It has to be embedded in the context. And so to imagine that humans are going anywhere by themselves, I think is crazy. It doesn't make any sense. So anyway, go ahead. I'm just, I'm just curious as to think, so the way that I should view intelligence and the, the, our capacity to build radio telescopes and send messages into mm -hmm. space, do and physics, develop rocketry, you know, do plasma physics. Do you think that that's, would you say that that is so human specific that we shouldn't be expecting it anywhere else? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. And so in that way, mm. humans are exceptional in that we're yeah. going to be, we're They're the ones unique, who's going to be able to, just like every other species. We're going to be able to, to take, to, to take our entire mm -hmm. microbiome mm -hmm. with us mm -hmm. and, you know, reach out across, across the galaxy. Well, probably not. We'll probably kill ourselves because we're so smart or stupid. I, th I, I, I think we are our own worst. We, we are our own worst enemy. Like, oh yeah, our grandkids—they'll be sending interstellar probes, you know? or they'll be dead. There won't be any. Now, we, now the problem is you're trying to make a somehow an objective statement about how good it is to be able to do these things, mm -hmm. and I'm saying, well, the same features of us that enable us to do that also enable us to destroy everything that we've ever done. Okay, that does not sound to me like an unmitigated oh exception. Good. Mm -hmm. It sounds to me like interestingly dangerous territory, but that's much like the challenges for any species. They have good things and bad things, and the good things have also have bad things associated with them, and so it's, it's kind of like this. Therefore, when something is like this, you don't say it's an unmitigated good and exception. It's got a lot of shit associated with it and a lot of good associated with it. I recognize that about humans, but I'm not going to concentrate on the good and forget about mm -hmm. the bad, the weaknesses. Okay. And that's all. I'm saying humans are unique, just like every other species. And species tend to exaggerate how good their good features are that make them unique. And that's what the nasalization quotient was all about. Okay. You know, we, yeah. we invented EQ. Mm -hmm. And if you're an elephant, you'd invent NQ. And then you say, we're here. And I'd, I created that y-axis so I'd be here. Mm -hmm. And what do I think? Ooh, see, there's a trend. That's a perfect example of vanity. On that, it, it's obvious that you're, if you follow only your line for, like, only your line of descent, mm -hmm. de only... Your ancestors? Yeah, basically. You're plotting if you, your ancestors. If you're, only looking, if you're only looking at your, at your own ancestors and you've selected mm -hmm. something that's very based on your unique species specific characteristics. You right? being an extreme example of that, maybe yeah. the best. Yeah. 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 Obviously, that's going to be things will, will have to trend towards you because it's not like you have fully formed elephants popping into existence. But is, is there not a way that we could do that? We could follow. 
basically all, all, not all, all is a big claim. Lots of lineages? Lots of lineages of different animals and mm -hmm. see if there's a trend mm -hmm. towards, you know, if there is an overall trend on earth towards nasalization or, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or EQ. Has anyone done that? Well, you're, you're, that's a big ask because mm. what you're asking is, let's go back to a time before there was nasalization. Let's go back to a time before there was a brain. And then it's hard to say, okay, we're going to measure brain size here because you're talking about the size of something that doesn't even exist. Mm -hmm. So and that's the sense in which everything we can talk about gets deconstructed as you go earlier and earlier in time. And that's for the same reason everything is species specific. Mm -hmm. And that's, that is an interesting feature of life and that tells you how unique or how, how maybe a set of measure zero, life on Earth and its adaptation, adaptations could be. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's the case or not, but it's certainly one of the, the logical failings that people who say heads are everywhere, therefore that we should expect aliens with head. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I lost my train of thought. Speaking, you brought that up. That was, um, was, that was this week's um, joking with Jochen mm -hmm. about how independent is independent enough to yes. make a generalization. Yes, 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 yes. It, I, I'm just curious, are there examples of things that you believe are truly independent? You know, you, you brought up the, the um, that fish re-evolving mm. um, teeth, I believe. But it wasn't so much that it grew completely new teeth, it just worked out how to turn that gene back on. Yeah, basically. the amphibians. Am oh, the amphibian amphibians. phylogeny, yes. Yeah. I think, no, I should say that I saw that and I said, this is a perfect example of what I'm talking about, but I didn't look deeply enough. Oh, okay. I, didn't I didn't follow the literature train to see, okay, let's look at the enzymatic protein pathways of this particular frog that has mm -hmm. teeth to see how similar its uh, teeth are to the teeth that were made by mm -hmm. the, the deeper parts of that tree. And, uh, but I'm, I'm very confident that I'm right about that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but I'm a little guilty because I didn't look carefully. Just out of curiosity, are there any things that you think are actually independent? Well. That's an interesting thing. When, when we discover life on Mars, we're, we're going to be trying to figure out is, how closely is it related to us. Is, mm -hmm. it, is it independent or not? Mm -hmm. And uh, now that's weird because the word independence is often refers to genetic independence. Okay, mm -hmm. so we're saying, hey, does it have a common ancestor, right? But, I mean, if you have a hydrothermal vent over here and another hydrothermal vent over here, and, and they have the very same chemistry because you're talking about the same earth and the same temperature gradients and the same redox potentials, the same chemotrophy could evolve there. Now, is that independent or not? They do not have informational, they do have informational independence, but mm -hmm. they do not have architectural uh, independence. So they're on the same, on the same uh, planet in the same type of environment with the same redox potentials, mm -hmm. but they have no inheritance. Mm -hmm. And so most biologists would say that's completely independent. But as a physicist, you can say, well, wait a minute. If I have the exact same setup experimentally and something happens, mm -hmm. you would hardly call that independent. No. Right? So that, it's a tricky term, independence. And, and it really depends on whether you're talking about biologists who are exclusively talking about uh, common ancestors. But physicists get into a little bit more basic and ask this question that we just talked about. You could be even more basic and say, well, wait a minute. Our universe has uh, baryons and, uh, you know, the... The matter antimatter asymmetry is blue. Mm. Well, this type of life only forms in universes with a matter antimatter asymmetry of within one percent of ours. You know, you could say that. And if, if they're that similar, then are they independent? No, they have the same antimatter matter anti asymmetry. So it really is a, a wide open question with with goes deeper and deeper. It's just turtles all the way down. You say. Well, it's it's interesting turtles all the way down because it's a, it's a we we are obliged to say what we mean when we use the word independence mm -hmm. and. It's interesting because we want to define it such that it's applicable to being useful over there. Yeah. That's why it has a really high threshold of independence. And that's why I, I think that that threshold has not been reached. And therefore, this extrapolation of convergences on Earth are almost irrelevant or pro completely irrelevant to trying mm -hmm. to predict life elsewhere. In, op in opposition to many, many, many people. But in that, in, in, in that case, when you're saying, well, they're not really independent if they have the same environment. If we're looking for life that also got started mm -hmm. on Earth-like planets mm -hmm. in, say, hydrothermal vents, mm -hmm. are you saying that they're not, like you could argue From, they're not even independent? Yeah, of course, of course. It, it, they would not be independent in the physics chemistry sense, mm -hmm. but would be independent in the informational 
uh, whatever coding they use, the arbitrary coding that, and all of, I mean, that, one of the points of the, this whole course is that origin of life is biochemistry and physics, and that is universal. Yeah. And then life goes, goes every which way, and who the hell knows where it can go. And uh, So we could very well expect to see something that is what basically Luca on other planets. Is that what you're... I wouldn't say basically Luca because there's a big difference between origin of life and Luca. Yeah. I can say the origin of okay. life, yes. I think the origin of life could... If we're going to talk about any similarities between here and there, I would say it's at the origins, and that's mm -hmm. where they're yeah. the most similar. Yeah. How similar that is, I do not know, but it's the thing that's least independent. Mm. And evolution after four billion years is <laughs> no holds bar. I mean, everywhere. Go crazy mm -hmm. directions that we should not... Quirkiness, I call it. Right? Now... This might, I do not intend in the, with this question to sort of demean your, your role as... Demean away. <laughs> an exobiologist, but um, it seems to me that, you're, that you fall clearly on the, the deep homology side of things, mm -hmm. and um, that the evolution of life is, is a lot more random than it is convergent. At so, four billion years later, but yeah. not at the origin. No. Yes, okay. Yes. But... If 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 you're if we're kind of we're stuck here on Earth like the well, best I didn't we say we're stuck here on Earth. I think we're going places. But you are. Go ahead, continue. <laughs> Go ahead, continue. Like the best we can do is try and, and see if the uh, try and, and and work out the atmospheres of potential other. Well, in the next few decades, decades after yeah. that, you know, we can yeah. go there maybe. But for now, is there really much? Is 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 exobiology sort of back to being a, a science without a subject in that? You just kind of defer to people trying to work out the origin of life here on Earth, but you're not. But because it seems, because I suppose you in particular, but also the field falls more on the the deep homology side of things. No, no, I, I think most of the field is on the convergence side. Okay, I'm, I'm, okay. I'm the outsider here. Okay, I think. Um, but in, in in that case, is there much to do until we can until we can further until we can actually get closer to the source. No, right? sure, there's a lot to do. And that's, if, um, yeah, there's a tremendous amount to do. And one is to figure out how life got started here. Mm -hmm. And we yeah. have, there's no better place in the universe to figure out how life got started on Earth than in the Earth, Earth yeah. and studying the earliest processes. And the progress that has been made in getting phylogenetic trees from all of these different metagenomic new trees. I mean, mm -hmm. those phylogenetic trees I showed you are literally from last year. Yeah. That is incredibly rapid progress, and they just added 50% to N most basally attached. Mm -hmm. And so that is incredible progress. And by using that, then you start to make progress of what was Luca metabolism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then you're getting close to, okay, what was the environment? Then you say, okay, it got started in these environments. Then you can ask, are those environments elsewhere? Mm -hmm. It looks to me like they are there. So I th so that suggests that there might be life everywhere, but I'll be damned if that's going to say there's going to be humans everywhere. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the probability of being a, they're finding a Klingon or a Superman is zero, zero. Just like the probability of aliens speaking English exactly with a, with this American accent. Mm -hmm. I think that probably is zero. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there's anything uh, weird or undermining about that. Or I don't think that undermines astrobiology or the search for the origin of life or trying to wonder about life elsewhere in the least. I think it, 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 it just makes, hey, this is good evidence, this is crap evidence. Okay. That's all I'm trying to do, mm -hmm. I think. <laughs> um, see, in that, I feel like there's, do you, I suppose, I, I, I know the answer to this, but like, you, you think there's a one-to-one -one overlay of what, you, what we would say, like, human likeness in, in, in your manner of referring to it, not like Sagan's manner, and the, the development of radio telescopes. Do you think that, say it again? Do you th like, you think that there's, there's absolutely no room for uh, some alien life to develop something that we would consider similar to a radio telescope in the same the, in, in the same way that it's equally unlikely for them to develop English. Yeah, yeah. It's unlikely for them to develop, oh. say, electrical engineering. That, that is my working hypothesis mm -hmm. based on the evidence that I've seen. I may be wrong, but I think that is by far is the most defensible position. That doesn't mean I'm absolutely sure about it, mm -hmm. uh, but it is based on the evidence I've seen. That's my conclusion. But doesn't this kind of go back to our questions of, of physically 
in independent versus um, informationally independent. Or say, so we've got the, the hydrothermal vents on two hydrothermal vents on Earth versus one on an exoplanet. Isn't that kind of the same? Can't we, can't we uh, extrapolate that to say like the laws of physics? Well, the, about the origin of life, you can certainly say mm -hmm. that. But about radio telescopes and what happens four billion years after the origin, no. But they, like, they, they are present and they, they determine how... Actually, no, that's a bad... This is one that's come, I'm coming up with my feet. Let me give you. Let me give you. An, like uh, let me give you the, the model that helps me in my head. Yeah. If you have a imagine if you had a one-dimensional universe, you start here and then you end up here. There's only one possibility. It's one-dimensional. Mm -hmm. Let's suppose you had a two-dimensional universe. Okay. You start here and then that's the origin where life gets started. And then you can go this way. You go this way. You go this mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. Now let's make it three-dimensional. You have much more space to go into, and then the likelihood of it, let's suppose that there's an equal probability of going this way, this way, this way, this way. Mm -hmm. That's three-dimensional. Let's suppose you have n dimensions. When you have n dimensions and you are at a point in an n-dimensional space that's four billion years evolution away from the origin, and you're asking the question, let's how are there, let's suppose that there are a hundred billion Earths in, I don't know, the galaxy or the you know the whole universe, observe the universe. And then you ask yourself, is my patch that I went to here, I don't know, it's a human patch in this n-dimensional space to, into which evolution has evolved, is that patch more likely than one part in a trillion? And that answer is not obvious to me. I think it's maybe, I think it's a set of measures zero, which means that the n-dimensional space is so large that after four billion years, we are at a place that is almost, or practically, a set of measures zero, <laughs> which when multiplied by however many Earth-like planets with hydrothermal vents and hot springs, you want to multiply them by, you still get right. zero. Yeah. And so that's an argument I think is plausible, mm -hmm. and that's one I, I'm, I think should be kept in mind in a way that it certainly is not kept in mind by most people who are interested in astrobiology because they want to be optimistic <laughs> and find mm -hmm. humans elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's being optimistic, I just think it's being vain. But I think I do kind of want to gently push back against the idea of these these... I think that you, in, you you often use English as mm -hmm. as the example. Do you think English would have would evolve? You did that to me. You did that to right. several physicists. Exactly because because everybody thinks English is quirky and therefore they don't expect it. So any reasonable person would not expect mm -hmm. aliens to be speaking English, and that's why I use it as the quirk and as an example of something that's so quirky because that's just the opposite of what most people have in their head mm -hmm. about human-like intelligence. But but. English is so fundamentally, like, language is a... I'm not talking about language, I'm talking about a specific language yeah, with okay. a specific so accent. Any individual language is, so, is, is an exercise in history. Exactly. Mm. Just like life. Exactly. Yeah, so just like life. Just sure. like life. But an exercise in history, not physics and statistics. Mm -hmm. That's the important part. But, like, the, 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 the basic rules that we... that exist, that allow for us to create radio telescopes and electrical engineering... Mm -hmm. That's not as history based as you don't think so. I think it's incredibly history based. Mm. Like I understand our our understanding of it is. Well, let's. One way to ask this question is sometimes we ask in one of the lectures is okay. Would you have, would science happen again? We think we've talked about this again. Mm -hmm. And so get rid of Western Europe, get rid of Greece, get rid of anything that mildly resembles science, and then ask the question when you rerun the tape of life, will science re-evolve? Will, will we make radio telescopes again? You know, I don't think we know the answer to that. I, some people say, sure, of course. Other people say, no way. Mm -hmm. So that's our knowledge, extent of our knowledge about that question. Uh, I, I'm not sure because it, it, there's so many... The whole historical precedence and pre-adaptations to creating a radio telescope are so complicated and hard to predict mm -hmm. that there's no schedule there mm -hmm. and who knows what they are the do you have to be do you have to be optically oriented rather than olfactory oriented mm -hmm. so if you had a human being that didn't have, see but had really good smelling would you do that or do you have to have these hands some people think oh hands are necessary and so dolphin big brains but no hands you know do you really need hands you have to have an imposable thumb could we have gotten there with four fingers you know these are the types of issues that nobody knows the answers to and uh but I think the sense of 
our own existence being inevitable is just the worst trap that humans fall into and it needs to be pushed back on. And that, Richard Dawkins makes this point again mm-hmm. and again. Mm-hmm. The only other thing that I wanted to gently push back on from this week's content was when you were ranking solutions to the Fermi paradox. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you put up there that life is common, but intelligent, quote unquote, mm-hmm. life is rare. And that I, you know, I will, I'll give you that one, but like rather low down, down your list was mm-hmm. like, we haven't been looking, we haven't been listening hard enough or like mm. for long enough. Yes. Right? Yeah. To me, that seems like it, it kind of seems like, um, the reverse situation of me trying to be like, yeah, uh, there could be human like intelligence niche, 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 but bec- because we're the first, we'll never be able to know that. Right. If we went and found evidence of other human like intelligence, that evolved and died out before we existed, then that would be a, a sign of that niche existing on mm-hmm. Earth. Mm-hmm. But we didn't. Mm-hmm. And so I can't make that claim, I can't make that theory, because, and, and so I have no evidence to support it so it doesn't stand up. But it seems to me that it could very well, that argument could, could apply to how common or rare we think um, human-like intelligence life is to develop on other planets, because we've only really been listening for what? When was the first radio telescope? 59, Nine. maybe. Well, 59 is when we started listening to other people. Mm. Uh, mm. 1932 with Jansky. So, so, like, very, very generously, 1932 was when we might have been maybe able to pick up the first thing. Mm-hmm. That's not even 100 years. Uh-huh. There's shit all 100 light years from mm-hmm. us compared mm-hmm. to the whole galaxy. All right. And similarly, we've only been broadcasting for 200 uh, years. Okay, but let me Most push, of that doesn't let go Let me push back on yeah. it. So... Most SETI efforts look at a star. Mm-hmm. You said planetary system star. Mm-hmm. And you go over here, not a star, not mm-hmm. a star. So for some reason, they think that if a civilization out there makes a radio telescope, they will somehow be con- centered on that star. And it's silly. Mm-hmm. Look, as soon as you develop radio telescopes, you get rocket ships, you go to other star systems, mm-hmm. and you produce all kinds of things, and then... You don't look for one star, the whole galaxy is colonized. At least that's the, the sense that most people, or many people, would say. And so the question is, you know, hey, is the galaxy colonized? You don't have to look at one to see that it's not. If, if colonization is something that is complete or 100%-ish. Mm-hmm. Other people say, wait a minute, the galaxy is so big that it's hard to travel interspe- interstellar distances. But I think, no, I, I, I think that... If we stay alive, we're going to expand out at a rate that's enormous by mm-hmm. geologic standards, and those geologic timescales have already passed. Mm-hmm. There were nine billion years of history of the universe before the sun even formed. Mm-hmm. That's plenty of time to develop rockets to go everywhere and, and colonize the entire galaxy. That is time when the universe was much less rich in a, vari- in a variety of elements. No, that's only the first two billion years. So only you two? take the nine, you yeah, two, because after, it, it goes up fairly quickly because these very short-lived stars are really polluting this, okay. but it takes about two billion years, and then you're at a pretty much of a level that we are today. And so... Um, that's interesting. So it, is it ha- like the accumulation has of slowed the down radically? Yeah, that's because the star formation rate about, uh, about a, uh, 10 billion years ago was enormous, and okay. it's been coming down ever since. Okay. Fair enough. And in addition to that, the first stars, because they didn't have those metals, mm-hmm. were gigantic, and boom, they put, they just had, all were supernova. Okay. Like right now, M stars are going to do nothing to mm-hmm. the, to the yeah. rich, but earlier on, the, it, was, it was called the star from the initial mass function of stars were top heavy, and mm-hmm. therefore, boom, 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 five million years, boom, yeah. five million years, boom, five million years, boom. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's why that rate was so large in the beginning, and the star formation rate was high, and then it's been coming down. So you, the argument there is that it doesn't matter really how comparatively small our radius, our search radius is, that if they're like... If you have reason to believe that the technological life would colonize at mm-hmm. some uh, high percentage. Mm-hmm. Then Earth should have already been colonized. Exactly, we shouldn't exactly. Be, we shouldn't that's even that's be the here. Fermi paradox. Yeah. Okay, okay. I understand your reasoning of it being less likely. Much better now. But that's also a reason why I say, hey, you said it, please look at Andromeda. There you can get, you know, 400 billion stars with one radio telescope mm-hmm. and you can ma- sample them all. But for some reason, it's been, ex- for a reason I don't understand, they've been 
star, star, star. We've looked at what fraction of the star. And I just think it's an irrelevant statistic to say what fraction of the stars of the galaxy you've looked at because that assumes that they will be, <laughs> they're individual and they'll never, the civilization will never, they'll yeah. never create a galactic federation. And it, it also seems just like an unrealistic expectation of what, of how we would use our energy, right? Going and targeting like one specific star mm -hmm. for, and you'd have to be doing it constantly for their sort of search at it, each individual point for it to be useful, right? That's just a, and, that's just a heap of energy that you're right. You're and in also, space. when technology gets advanced, you don't shoot sh stuff off of the huge, you don't broadcast radar and television. You just make it cable, mm. and you know your brain is not sending radio signals to the universe. But no. there's all kinds of things going on. Mm. Similarly, if you, the Earth gets cyber turns into this Google consciousness, it's going to be wires here that's not mm -hmm. going to be broadcasting out. Matter of fact, if you broadcast out, that means you're losing. You're dissipating energy in a stupid way. And mm -hmm. we will say, we want to, don't want to lose energy, so we'll put all mm -hmm. the, the coverings on the, the wires so they don't do that. So that's, that's what Carl Schroeder said. Any sufficiently advanced technology will be indistinguishable from nature because it's not, it, it becomes less wasteful mm -hmm. and less visible. Uh, I think, and I, I think that there's some truth to that. That's why I kept asking people that. Mm -hmm.